moving something around my mouth. It's, it's a cough drop. So I try to keep my voice, my throat a little moist. I don't know if it's more I talk or what, but uh, <clears throat> it gets worse and worse, it seems like. Anyway, today we are in week 21 of our Acts of the Gospel Shared series. <laughs> I forgot you would do that. Best friend. Uh, we're, in Acts, we're in week 21. We've been in this for 21 weeks now in our Acts of the Gospel Shared series. And if you haven't been around for all of this series, it started way back in February, the first Sunday in February. And we are looking at each time the gospel is shared in a public setting in the book of Acts. Uh, so we've looked at the location where it was shared, who shared the gospel, what the responses were to the gospel being shared, and uh, also what that means for us today. Right now we are in the middle of Paul's third missionary journey. Paul was the one, as we've seen throughout the last few months, a couple of months, that God has specifically chosen to take the message, the gospel, to the Gentiles, those who lived outside of Israel. And in doing so... Paul has become really the first missionary of all time as he's going on these missionary journeys to share the gospel, the good news that Jesus is the Christ all over, to places where they worshiped false gods and to places where his life was constantly in danger. And throughout all of this, Paul never stopped sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today we get to see the gospel shared, they gathered together. Back in January of this year, if you can remember, we looked for those five weeks at the word gospel. We looked at the gospel, what the gospel is, why it's important, why we need it, uh, why we need to share it, how we can share the gospel. And I did that so that when we got into this, we could have a good understanding of what the gospel is before we went into this series where we see the gospel being shared over and over throughout the book of Acts. We continue to see how important the gospel was to those first century Christians then, to share the good news of Jesus Christ. It was important then, and it's still extremely important for us today here in our world. The task of sharing the gospel, it was meant for, the, for, for ones like Peter and John and Simon and Philip and Timothy and Paul and so many others, but the task of sharing the gospel is also meant for all of us today. Every one of us. Way back in February, when we started this series off in the first week, I gave a couple of verses that I want to remind us of. First one I want to remind us of comes from Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 16. These words are part of what we know as the great commission that Jesus gave to his disciples. And Jesus said this to his disciples. And he said to them, Go into all the world, and preach the gospel to all creation. The one who has believed and has been baptized will be saved. But the one who has not believed will be condemned. So Jesus made it clear to them that they were to go all over preaching the gospel. And that's what we've seen happening throughout the book of Acts now for several months. It all started way back in Acts chapter 2 in Jerusalem on that day of Pentecost. The day the church began. And it's been spreading ever since in this series. This is also our commission. It's our command. It's our instructions to share the gospel as believers. Also, I shared this verse in week 1 as well. It's from Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Just before Jesus ascended back into heaven. These are kind of what the, the final words that we have recorded of Jesus in Scripture before he ascended back into heaven. He looked at his disciples and he said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and as far as the remotest part of the world. And that's what we've seen throughout the book of Acts. They were witnesses first in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and now Paul has been taking the gospel throughout all of his missionary journeys, all three of them. And from the very first century on, it remains our command, our instructions as well, to share the gospel and be his witnesses. And today we're going to see another interesting story that deals with Paul. And we're also going to get to see really why it is, one of the reasons anyway, why we here at Double Creek Church of Christ take the Lord's Supper every week when we come together. 
Before we get into it, let's do what we always do. Let's set the scene quickly here. We'll do this quickly as we pick up where we were last week. For the last two weeks, we were in Ephesus with Paul and others. And at the end of last week, there was about to be a riot in the streets of Ephesus because of Christianity, because of how it was growing, and because those people who were now becoming followers of Jesus, they no longer had a need for Paul and false gods like Artemis. So there were silversmiths and others, but especially silversmiths who were in Ephesus, who were extremely angry, as I mentioned last week, because these followers of Jesus now had no need for these silversmiths, man-made images or shrines. They were losing income. Then those who still worshipped Artemis, that false god, they took to the streets chanting about how great Artemis was, this false god. And it was enough that as we get into it in Acts chapter 20, in the first verse we read this. After the uproar had ceased, Paul sent for the disciples. And when he had exhorted them and taken his leave of them, he left to go to Macedonia. Typically, Paul would leave one of these cities that he was visiting after something like this happened, when people started to oppose him because his life would be in danger. But here we see that Paul really had enough followers, enough strong ones who were followers now of Jesus in Ephesus, that he could leave them there to carry on the work. So Paul leaves and goes to Macedonia. He goes through all the districts there in that area. He goes to Greece. Now, no doubt... Paul was doing this to check in on those followers of Jesus. And no doubt he was sharing the gospel in each one of these places. That's just who Paul was. He spends three months in Greece. Once again, while he's in Greece, there is another plot against him. And so he leaves and he returns through Macedonia. And so what we are seeing right here is different than the first two missionary journeys. On this third missionary journey... Paul would visit some of the same cities more than once because he returned back through Macedonia, through those cities, on his way back. He also had a group of men with him here uh, in his travels. You can read their names in Acts chapter 20 and verse 4. Now those men, they went on ahead of Paul, and they were waiting for Paul at a place called Troas. And it appears... At this point, obviously, that Luke, the author of the book of Acts, is with Paul at this time. Because in the fifth verse, Luke says that the others had gone ahead of us. And they were waiting at Troas. And the sixth verse said this. We sailed from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came to them at Troas within five days. And there we stayed seven days. Now, Troas, this city, it's not a new place in Scripture. We've already seen it before in Scriptures. It's not a new place for Paul and his journeys. He visited this city on his second missionary journey. So he's not planning a new church here. He's already done that. And they stayed there for seven days. This is kind of almost like the first revival of all time, you could say. Paul was there and he went just for a week and talked with these people and met with them. But this is where we pick up today. Today we get to see that they gathered together. Now there can be no doubt about the importance, I believe, of Christians gathering together, meeting together as believers. It's extremely important. That's not all we're here to do. But gathering together as Christians is extremely important. When we get to the seventh verse of Acts chapter 20, we read this. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, but he prolonged his message until midnight. There are a couple of things I think we need to take note of here in this seventh verse. The first, I think, is being those seven words, on the first day of the week. If you've ever asked yourself why the church gathers together, why we meet together as Christians like we are right now on Sunday, on the first day of our week, this is one of the reasons. The example we have here is that they came together on the first day of the week. Now the phrase here is kind of like a Greek way of designating the day that we call Sunday. 
But the question kind of remains. Were they meeting on a Sunday morning or so like we are, or was it a Saturday night? It really depends on whether Luke, the author, was using Jewish time or Roman time. See, a Jewish day was from sunset to sunset. Roman days were like ours, midnight to midnight. So if they were following Jewish time, this meeting could have started any time between Saturday evening to Sunday morning or evening. If they were following Roman time, it could have been Sunday morning or Sunday evening. No matter how you look at it, it's still the first day of the week for the Jewish person or first day of the week for the Roman person. And with the understanding that Paul was about to leave Ephesus and possibly never be back, it appears they wanted this to be a little bit of a longer period of time. And when we read it there, we read that Paul actually prolonged his message until midnight. You know, the simple truth is, we don't know what time of day it was. It doesn't matter. But it was certainly the first day of the week for those people. This is the first time in the book of Acts, the first time in history, really, that we have a reference being made to a time when they gathered as the church. We don't have any other references leading up to this as far as the day. This is the first time we have a reference for the actual day they met together as a church. There is plenty of evidence, however, over the years that the Christians met regularly on the first day of the week and have for a long time. No matter how we put it, they came together right here in Troyes on the first day of the week as Christians. Gathering together, meeting together was extremely important to the early Christians. How important is it for people today? Now, I think it's become so easy to just find something else to do. Now, I remember when I was growing up that we could not have games on Sunday. We weren't allowed to. In high school, we had a baseball game on a Saturday night once in the tournament. We were the last game of the day. And our game started later that day because the other games went longer than usual. And during our game, as soon as the clock hit midnight, they stopped our game. We were not allowed to play on Sunday. Fast forward that to today's world. People find every excuse they can to do something else on Sunday. Do people even care that gathering together at the church takes place on Sunday mornings anymore? That that should be the most important. How easy is it to schedule church and meeting together around all of our other things in life? See, we do things backwards sometimes in our world today. Especially when it comes to church. Far too often, church takes a back seat to other things that are just more important to us. Really, that appears to always have been the case. I want you to pay attention to what the Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 10, verses 23 through 25. He said, let's hold firmly to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let's consider how to encourage one another in love and good deeds. Not abandoning our own meeting together, as is the habit of some people. But encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Skipping out, I'll say, on meeting together is not just a thing today. It was a thing in the first century, obviously. Here we're told not to abandon our meeting together, as was the habit of some people. It was going on then, too. And so today, still almost 2,000 years later, it's still an issue in the church. It's too easy just to skip out on meeting together because we want to do something else instead. Even after warnings like this here in Hebrews, in the scriptures, even after warnings like this, we have to understand we can't be that way. Personal contact. I truly believe this. Personal contact like this as a family of believers is not just something in the Bible that is expected or suggested. It's commanded. But today, to be honest, it's just too easy to do something else 
And if we want to, we'll catch it later if we feel like it. Let's not abandon meeting together. Let's not become, let it not become a habit to just skip out on church to do something else we would rather do. But when you get back to this seventh verse here, they didn't just come together to meet together. That was certainly a part of it. But did you notice what Luke says they came together to do? It said, on the first day of the week, when we gathered together to break bread. Now, breaking bread could have been anything from having a meal together or taking the Lord's Supper, communion together. Here, it's used the same way as we see in Acts 2, verse 42. They gathered together here so they could take the Lord's Supper, communion together. According to what Luke writes here, they gathered, they met together on that first day of the week to take communion. The rest of it just was part of it. So if you really think about it, people who gather together and refuse to take the Lord's Supper together are depriving themselves. Not only of something special for that day, but they're depriving themselves of something that the early church would do. And that is meeting together on the first day of the week to break bread. Remember, this is the only time, the first time we have any instance of them coming together, when they would come together as a church, and they were coming together with the purpose of breaking bread. Doing this on the first day of the week here for the early church never got old. It never lost its meaning. If you've ever heard anyone say that it loses its meaning, the Lord's Supper communion loses its meaning by doing it every week, then the simple question is, why doesn't everything else we do on Sunday lose its meaning? We sing every Sunday morning. Why? Wouldn't it lose its meaning if we just keep doing it every single week and singing the same things? Well, we sing because it's a way of worship. We take up offering every Sunday morning. Why? We don't see any examples of an offering being taken up on Sunday mornings like, the, like we do in the New Testament. Well, we may not see it, but we do know the Bible teaches us to tithe. It teaches us to give cheerfully. And obviously, we take up an offering to give back to God so we can grow His kingdom. You know, we pray each Sunday morning, don't we, when we come together. Why? Why wouldn't praying lose its meaning? Because we do it too often. I think you get the point. Take the Lord's Supper, communion, when we gather together like the early church did, keeps Jesus, what he did for us, at the front and center of our worship. It can never lose its meaning. No more than singing, no more than praying, no more than reading your Bible, no more than just meeting together. And I've said it before, but if taking communion were to ever lose its meaning for you, that's a you problem. That's not a problem with doing it too often. Remembering what Jesus did for us on the cross should never lose its meaning. If anything, people could point out that the church maybe even took communion more than once a week or just whenever they gathered together. They certainly did not do it just once a year. They certainly did not do it just three or four times a year. It was a regular part of what they did when they gathered together as the church. On the first day of the week, they gathered together to break bread. And that wasn't all that happened that day, was it? As the seventh verse goes on, we read this. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, but he prolonged his message until midnight. Paul began talking to them. The word used here meant that he was kind of reasoning with them. Remember, these people in Ephesus, they're some somewhat new followers of Jesus Christ. And they've got all kinds of other false gods in that city that they might worship, especially Artemis. We've already seen that we know Paul is about to leave them the next day. So he speaks to them until midnight. This seems to be a little bit longer of a meeting than a normal gathering that they would have. Because it says that Paul prolonged his message. 
See, Paul really, I think, wanted to give them as much as he could before he left them the next day, knowing that he may never be back. Imagine if I stood here today and decided to just speak until I couldn't speak anymore. Imagine if I decided to prolong my message here today and make it longer than normal. I wonder if the same thing would happen here that happened in Troas. Paul goes on. Probably, as I said, longer than usual here. And we read that they're in this upper room in this place. We find out later that it was the third floor, really, of this building they were at. This place had many lamps, or you could say torches, really, to keep it lit. Because, hey, they're going till midnight. And then out of nowhere, we read about a young man named Eutychus. Eutychus was sitting on the windowsill there on the third floor. Now, if I prolong my message here for a few hours... And we stayed throughout the afternoon, maybe even into the evening. What would happen to you all? I imagine some of you would just get up and leave. I couldn't blame you. You know, we certainly cannot interrupt lunchtime, right? The buffets, those lunch specials, they're too good to pass up. No, seriously, though, I mean, I know some people would get up and leave. Like, okay, that's enough. I've been here long enough. I imagine some of you would stick it out. And possibly a few of you might even enjoy it. Some of you might stay around trying to stick it out, but you'd be uncomfortable. You'd get restless. You'd be fidgety. You'd be moving around in your seats trying to get comfortable. No doubt, somebody here would fall asleep. What are y'all looking at Tony for? <laughs> Well, back to this young man, Eutychus, here in Acts. He falls asleep while Paul is speaking his prolonged message. He falls down from the third floor of this building and was picked up dead. Luke does not say he was unconscious. Luke does not say he was uh, asleep or knocked out. He was dead. And we read that Paul goes down there and stretches himself out over Eutychus and his life returns. Now at least here, nobody's going to fall from three floors down and die on the spot. But understand something about these verses here. As I said, this is the first recording that we have of what would take place when the church, when the body of Christ, the followers of Jesus would gather together. Kind of like we do today. Maybe they sang a little when they were together. I don't know. We don't have any knowledge of that. It wouldn't be right or wrong, obviously, if they did. But we do know that they gathered together, not at church, but as the church to break bread. And while they were together, Paul began to preach this message. And so in today's world, we've kind of tried to set up our services to be something similar. I said it before in this series, but... Part of our responsibility as the church today, as the body of Christ, is to follow the examples set forth by the early church as best we can. Obviously, we don't do everything just like they did. For one, they were not sitting in anything like this. They didn't have these nice buildings like this for the church to grow up in. The temple was nice. They didn't meet in the temple. It was typically in a house or something like that. So we try to follow this same pattern. You think about us here at our church right here. Think about what we do in America as the body of Christ, as the church. See, we don't get a clear picture at all in the scriptures of the order of how a gathering should take place. So that's kind of just left up to each local congregation. And we all do it a little bit different, right? We basically follow the same pattern here every single Sunday with very little changes unless I add some video or something into it at the beginning. You know, we open up with announcements, a call to worship. Uh, we pray, we sing two songs, we have a communion meditation, we sing another song, we have communion, then offering, we have a sermon, we have a hymn of invitation, and then we close it out. Nothing wrong with that. I've been in some churches, though, where... Communion was done at the end. Ooh, how 
dare they? <laughs> it's not the way we've always done it. I mean, there's some really where churches have done it at the end of the service. Jefferson was like that where we used to go. They did it after the hymn invitation. To be honest, I loved it. I loved it because if singing didn't really get someone's heart ready for worship or for communion, the sermon would be good. Gave you a new way really to think when you're taking communion after you've heard the sermon. But like I said, those things, they're just decided by each local congregation. There's no right or wrong way to do any of that. There's no, no right or wrong way for the order of how the church gathers to. There's no right or wrong way for the type of music or for the chairs that we sit in or pews or for the buildings that we meet in or anything else like that. But today, in Acts chapter 20, what we've seen is that the early church gathered together. This was a common practice. It was something they looked forward to, I believe. Instead of finding something else to do, I believe they wanted to be together when they could. And I think the church in America in many ways is missing out on that so much. Today, it's too easy for people to just skip out. Find something else to do or do something else. As I said earlier, sometimes church is scheduled around all of our other activities. When it should be the other way around. Our activities, the things we want to do, should be scheduled around church. And so in this section today, what we've seen are simple patterns of things they would do when they gather together. And so today we try our best as Christians to follow the pattern. Not a specific order of things, but the pattern of just what they would do when they met together as the early church. I don't think many churches do that. I think there are many who have abandoned the simple truths, basic truths of the early church to do it their own way or to do things the way they just want to. And I'm not talking about order or style or anything like that. But for us, let's continue to follow the example set forth by the early church as best we can. I want to thank you for joining us for our 21st week in this series. We've still got a few weeks left in this series where we're looking at uh, each time the gospel is shared in the book of Acts. Uh, there's so much going on. The church was just spreading like a wildfire. It was growing during this book. It was exciting. People were loving each other. People were doing things for each other. And I see a lot of that here at this church as well. The love for each other, the serving each other, the concern for each other, the praying for each other, the wanting to meet together, the wanting to be together. You know, if you go to a lot of churches, they if they have a midweek service on Wednesday, it's usually a small percentage of people that even come to it. We have a pretty good percentage of people that attend ours. You know, we even have some who would love to be there but just aren't physically able to come. We understand that. I think we got a lot of people here who just love gathering together as believers in Jesus Christ. That's what the early church did. They looked forward to that. Now, as Paul was going through this missionary journey, as we talked about, I think it was Wednesday night, he would share this gospel so that he could save lost souls. So they could become, so they could know Jesus. So they could become a child of God. So they could be made right. And we always had that opportunity to do that. If you've never made a decision to become a follower of Jesus Christ, to put your faith in Christ, to confess Him before others, to be willing to repent and say, I just I want to stop living for myself, I want to start living for God, and to be immersed, be baptized in the waters, to have your sins washed away, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, you always had that opportunity to do so. Reach out to us and let's make that happen. Today we're going to stand and we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. We're going to sing the first and the last verses of song number 184, Whiter Than Snow. 